the Royal Flying Doctor Service Queensland section is home to some of the most highly regarded pilots in the world. Their skill and expertise are second to none, but many of them didn't start their careers in aviation. Some of them have had very successful careers in completely unrelated fields. One of them is Steve Wallace. Stephen Wallace, and I'm the senior base pilot at Brisbane base of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Steve worked in banking for 10 years before deciding to pursue his lifelong dream of becoming a pilot. He's now been with the service for 10 years. I'm Edwina Stott, and this is the RFDS Queensland section podcast, Roots the Runway series, which features the stories of our pilots and how they came to work for the Flying Doctor. I sat down with Steve at the Brisbane base and began by asking him whether he'd always wanted to be a pilot. I think so. It was fairly early in life. When I was a teenager, I um, had an interest in, in aeroplanes. My brother um, had a private pilot licence, so he used to take us flying as kids. And then I was into model aeroplanes. And from there, I had an inkling that I'd really like to do this for a career when I finished school. So throughout school, was that your end goal, to become a pilot? Uh, it was. I didn't know about the Royal Flying Doctor Service back then, so I was interested in the military because you don't have to pay for your flying lessons and whatnot. So when we had the career days in high school, I went straight to, to talk to the recruiters. And unfortunately, I wore glasses back and that was an automatic no for the military flying. So I had to go back to the drawing board and think of a new plan. Really? So when you realised that the military wasn't going to be for you, what did you do then? What was your next path to try and get into aviation? Well, this was the late 80s, so civil aviation in Australia, there were pilot strikes and um, aviation wasn't a particularly good path to go into money-wise and career-wise. So I kind of, when I left school, I, um, I still had it in the back of my mind, but I joined the Commonwealth Bank and went into a, a banking career for a while, mainly to um, save up the money for my own flying career. But I had a mini career in there for about 10 years before I switched over to flying. Quite a long time in banking then. What did you do? I ended up in management of small regional country banks and dealing with people, which has really helped in this career as well. Wow, I bet. And also your calculations, I suppose, would really help with being a pilot, working out logistics and fuel and that kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit of that as well. It's definitely a numbers game in both, so... Yeah, how interesting. And for most people, 10 years in a career isn't a short spell. So you must have enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. And I was beginning a family then as well. So um, so that worked in well with that. And there was a bit of uh, traveling around the countryside and meeting new people. And um, it, yeah, it was a good career. But in the background, I was, um, I was flying in those regional towns and building my hours uh, with my private pilot's license and then getting my commercial pilot's license as well. So you were flying whilst you were working at the banks? Yes, yeah, I was, you know, I was getting the hours and the experience needed for my commercial licence. And I suppose paying for it as you went along? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow, so you were based in regional Queensland or elsewhere in Australia? Uh, no, I grew up in, um, in the southeast suburbs of Melbourne and that's where I got my, uh, was back in those days it was called a restricted pilot licence, uh, which allowed you to fly in the local area and take passengers around. So I did that there. Then I moved over to Perth in Western Australia. That was when I first got married to um, get away from family, really, and start our lives out together. And I con- continued my um, private flying over there and ended up doing my commercial licence in Toowoomba. My brother owned an aeroplane in those days and he kindly let me use it at a, dis- at a discounted rate. So, yeah, that's where I started my link with Queensland. Fantastic. And when you started flying, was the addiction instant? Was it as good as you thought it would be being behind in the cockpit of a plane? Oh, definitely, yeah. I'd flown radio control model aeroplanes for a few years and the, the aeroplane was always up there having the fun. So as soon as I got myself into the seat, I, yeah, I knew it was for me. Everything about aviation I just loved. And you said your brother used to fly quite a bit. What did he do in aviation? What was uh, his He job? was in the military. So he flew Black Hawk helicopters in the military. He had a great career in there, so I was always watching what he was doing and sort of, you know, trying to get an idea for myself of how I could make it happen for myself. So you started flying whilst you were working in this day job, I suppose, in the banks. And then when did you realise that it was time to take the aviation to be your main job? Yeah, it was definitely around the mid-90s. I'd been in the bank for a little while and it was either that banking career was going along quite well as well. And I thought, eventually, here, I'm going to have to make a break before it gets too good. So, so eventually, I just did it. Yeah, I I got my commercial license and then started looking around for a flying job, which I found up in the Gove in the Northern Territory. 
Oh yeah, so what did you do for your first job in aviation? What were you flying then? It was with a company called Lena Air, which um, was owned by an Aboriginal corporation out of Gove in the Northern Territory. It had Cessna 206s and a Britain Norman Islander, and those aircraft were used to fly the Indigenous people around between their communities, come into the main town for shopping. Uh, we used to take uh, health workers, doctors and teachers out to the communities to, to visit those people. And that's where I got a real interest in helping in the community and helping people and using flying to assist in the community. When you got your first job in aviation, was it surreal? You know, because obviously it had been a long time coming. You know, you'd worked in banking for 10 years. You'd always wanted to work. When you finally could call yourself a pilot, was that quite weird for you? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I'd been around aeroplanes pretty much all my life. But to do that first commercial flight where I had nobody with me and I was taking passengers and getting paid for it, it was very surreal. And I've still got a photo of that day. And yeah, I still treasure, treasure that. Really? So when was that? When was your first flight? It was early, it was probably March 2001. Long time ago, big difference between now and then. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I still pinch myself about what I'm flying today and where I am and what we're doing. And um, I really love what we do today. But I can see that since that day, that first commercial flight, most of the flying jobs that I've had has been building up to the career that I really wanted, which is this. And every step along the way has sort of helped in some way to achieve that goal. And so from your first job in Gove, working with the Indigenous community there, what was your next job? Where did you move on to? I moved on to, I had a lot of flying hours there, so I stayed there for five years. I couldn't be one of those pilots who stayed in one job and kept moving around the country every six months because we had a family, kids in school and things like that. So we had to consider that as well. So I was in Gove for five years and then there was no more flying there's nowhere else to go except to continue what I was doing there. So to, to move forward in aviation, I moved down to Alice Springs with a company called Aboriginal Air Services, So which had the same aircraft that I've been flying in Go, but they had bigger aircraft as well. So they had something that I could offer them and then something that they could offer me as well. So that was great. Moved down to Alice Springs and I had some family down there, so that was nice to be back closer to family. And I flew for the, the, the company on mail runs so we used to go out of Alice Springs down to through Ayers Rock down to all the communities right down to Kalgoorlie in Western Australia and then back again stay overnight down there do a couple of runs between the communities there and all the way back to Alice Springs the next day and then some other other uh, local runs as well. So being in such remote communities you know obviously you said you're from just outside of Melbourne was it quite different adjusting to being in those regional communities or do you think that was something that you were very comfortable with? I was pretty comfortable with that because I had visited there a lot. I had, as I mentioned, I had family in Alice Springs, so a different brother to one that was in the army also owned his own aeroplane and um, he used that to fly between those indigenous communities to set up solar panels and things like that. Had his own company doing that. So I used to, on my holidays, I used to go out with him and then fly out to those same communities that I ended up flying into with my own job. So. And when you were flying in Alice Springs, you were living... Around there too? Yes, living in Alice Springs. We bought a house there and um, kids had schools and my wife had a job there and we made that our home for five years again. Now we seem to move on every five years except for this job here. So yeah, had a lot of fun in Alice Springs. It's a very social community. The people at work, really fun to be around and a great time living there. That's so great. So where did you move on next? Uh, So I'd always had the idea of the Royal Flying Doctor Service in the back of my mind and it was quite daunting because here we fly single pilots so you really have to know what you're doing and you have to be confident, you have to experience as well. So I had it in the back of my mind but it wasn't something that I really wanted to push for until a certain stage where a friend of mine had that I work with in Gove had joined the Flying Doctors a few years before and he was based in Mount Isa. And just in passing, I sent him an email and said, oh, are there any jobs going with the Flying Doctors? And he sent me an email back that was about three pages long because he's a good typist. (laughs) And pretty much said that I should get an application in straight away. So from that, I put an application in and uh, had an interview about a week later and then had a job about two days after that. So it all happened very quickly from that email that I sent him. Goodness, so I bet the next week you probably were sat there thinking, oh my goodness, what have I done? How's this happened? Well, that's exactly right, because I was just settled in my own little life there and it was all going along nicely and suddenly it was all happening. We had to move schools, move house again, um, had to start a new job and all that different state. 
but I was quite used to moving around at that stage. So I was really excited about flying for the Flying Doctors and, um, and it's been all it promised to be. So when you found out that you got into the Flying Doctor and it had been this lifelong ambition, how did you feel? Was it just overwhelming? Oh, it was. I was over the moon and it was flying the aircraft that I wanted to fly. They had At that stage, they had the King Air in, in Man Eyes, which I was very excited about, and also the PC-12, so there was a bit of a variety in the flying. And I called ahead and talked to the people there, and they were really friendly. Again, um, it's a remote town, so most people there are, are very close with each other. They're like family rather than just friends, so they were very welcoming, even over the phone. So I was excited about moving there and excited about flying for the Flying Doctors. Yeah, and so when you initially started with the Flying Doctor, I presume you would have had to do training and go through a whole new system. What was that like when you were first coming on board with the organisation? Yeah, there was a lot of training. Some of it was common to the training that I had with other companies and some was quite different with the medical side of things. But I enjoyed both. Part of the training was here in Brisbane, so it was an initial uh, theory ground school about the King Air aircraft and once I'd finished that then I went up to Mount Isa for the actual practical training and learning how to fly the King Air um, so at that stage it was it was a great time again it was by I was lucky enough to be trained by our previous chief pilot uh, Rick Davies so he came up personally from Brisbane and trained me and he didn't like the the heat or the bumps coming from <laughs> Brisbane so um, the guys up there were joking that I had the longest ever King Air endorsement because he would get to about 9 o'clock in the morning and go, oh, that's enough for today, uh, everybody go home. So it took me a long time to get endorsed. I loved that time and everybody else was waiting for me to get online and start doing my share of the work. <laughs> How funny. So when you initially started with The Flying Doctor, were there skills that you'd learned in those previous jobs that you brought on board that were massively useful to you once you joined the organisation? Yeah, I discovered that pretty much everything I'd done in aviation was sort of leading up to flying for the RFDS in that um, the performance of the aircraft. I'll start from the start, pretty much those um, that job in Gove that I had was really good for bush flying, so landing on those unprepared airstrips um, out in the middle of nowhere and being aware of what the wind's doing and where the trees are and all that sort of thing. Um, and dealing with people as well, different pe- people from different cultures and, and all that kind of thing. Then the jobs in Alice Springs, I flew turbine aircraft down there so that was good for operating the turbine engines that we operate with the King Air and also the performance so I flew a metro line about out of Alice Springs as well for Pearl Aviation which was a, a top level company so it had the same sort of training organisation so I was very familiar with how to operate it, how standard operating procedures worked with very similar level of, of quality that we have here at the RFDS so I was very familiar with those sort of systems that we have so pretty much everything combined together that I've done in the past help me to operate well with the Flying Doctors. And so you said that you wouldn't have wanted to push for the Flying Doctors before you'd gained that experience. Did you feel ready when you actually did email your friend or was it a bit of a shock that you actually got the interview and everything? Yeah, it was, it was a shock. I was excited, but I, was, I felt that I was ready and I had some good experience. I had um, you know, maybe four or 5,000 flying hours, um, some turbine time, some twin time, metro liner time. Uh, in command and as co-pilot so I thought that I was ready but there's always that bit of anticipation um, sort of wondering how how I will you know go flying single pilot and with a flight nurse and operating a medical aircraft so there was a bit of both but it's been really good. And so when you eventually got checked to line and you started flying with the Flying Doctor how different is the flying that the organisation do compared to those previous aviation jobs that you'd had? Uh, once I'm in the pilot seat, it's pretty much the same. I'm in my comfort zone. I know what to do and what, how to do it. It's pretty much when you land and then you have to deal with the patient. When, when you're new with the flying doctors, you get some very, very good training with the people that have been there before, but then you've got to figure out how to do things for yourself and there's unique challenges that you face, especially in Mount Isa, you might be collecting a patient from the back room of a house and they can't move, so you've got to figure out how to get a stretcher through hallways and out a narrow door and asking the doctor for advice on how the patient can and can't be moved. So pilot is involved in that because we operate as a small aeromedical team. You have to use your brain in slightly different ways to what a pilot is normally thinking. Mm, Interesting. Very different to how you would ordinarily work. Is there one day that really stands out to you as a remarkable day with the organisation? What A particular rescue or somebody that you've helped that you just think, wow, that was really remarkable and unexpected? 
Yeah, there's many, many. I've been with the Flying Doctors for nine years now, so there's a few that really stand out. You see some people with some pretty horrific injuries, and one of those was a penetrating eye injury out of Emerald in the middle of the night. So the why it sticks out in my mind is that the medical crew were quite busy. Often a patient is stable and it's quiet down the back of the aircraft and all that kind of thing. But on this particular flight, there was quite a bit of activity down the back of the aircraft. Uh, they were asking me to ring ahead so that they could talk to a coordinator about you know, further care for the patient. And I remember thinking, you know, is there anything I can do to make this airplane go quicker and get this job, you know, get this patient to where he needs to go quicker? But of course it's not. Once we're up in the cruise, there's only a certain speed we can do. So, so that sticks out in my mind a lot because of the activity that's happening down the back of the aircraft, the different opening and shutting of drawers and, and you know, the, the flight nurse and the doctor talking loudly to each other and whatnot. So, yeah, that, that sticks out in my mind. There's a few other ones. You transfer um, young children. I've got, well, I had young children. They've grown up a bit now. But, um, but you always sort of those jobs with young children stick out in your mind. And also every now and again we go to an aviation type incident or accident and those stick out in my mind as well because you know, we're pilots and they're pilots so you know it's uh, dealing with the people who are in the same occupation as you're in so mm. wow so really remarkable and you say about working so closely with the your flight nurse or your doctor or the other person that you're flying with does that take some adjusting to i mean being such a tight unit of two Yes, it definitely does. And the, you asked before about the differences with previous positions and this job, the, the differences. And part of that is getting used to what's happening in the back of the aircraft. Normally it's quiet in you know, other flying jobs. But this one, there's banging happening with drawers opening and closing and different smells with medical equipment and, and wipes and whatnot. So, um, so that took a little bit of getting used to, you know, a month or two to get used to when I first started. And then working as part of that team is a big part of the training when you join the Flying Doctors. So the crew here know that people coming from other positions aren't used to that. So that, that's a lot of what you have to get used to when you first join. So a lot of training goes into that. But yeah, it does take a while to get used to and how to communicate properly and what's, what are the right questions to ask and how much we need to know, how much we don't need to know as the pilot, as part of that team. Yeah, wow, a really unique set of skills, I suppose, that you wouldn't get in any other career. No, that's exactly right. It takes a while to get used to, but the people that hang around for a long time really enjoy that. It's different to any other flying job. It's different to an airline pilot job. It's different to a charter pilot, anything like that. Yeah, and I suppose the one thing, I've spoken to a few pilots for the series, and the one thing that everybody says is that no two days are the same. You know, you never know what you're going to expect. Is that true of the flying too? Is it very varied? Yes, yeah, definitely. We turn up to work not knowing what we're going to do for the day, literally. So we have a plan. I always come in and get the aircraft ready so that it's it's ready straight away so that if we do get an urgent call, we're ready to go straight away. So I start with making sure the aircraft is right to go. Usually in Brisbane here, we, we're on call, but we do a lot of inter-hospital type transfers from places up the coast, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, Rockhampton, Gladstone, that sort of thing. So pretty much we're 95% guaranteed that we're going to be flying somewhere within the first couple of hours of our shift. So um, I get ready to go, then go and check the weather, do a flight plan, and then by that stage I've normally had a page from our central coordination centre, and then off we go for our flying. And where's the central coordination centre? Is that based in Brisbane? Yeah, sorry, it's called Retrieval Services Queensland. It's based in Kedron with the emergency services unit there. You've been doing it for a really long time now, but do you ever get nervous on a day? You know, do you ever think, oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen? Or does your training, is your training so good that you always think, no, I'm good, I'm ready to go? Uh, there can be sometimes a bit of nerves, but mainly if there's a few associated issues, like there's an urgent job, plus there's weather, plus maybe some. sometimes you get a niggling aircraft issue that you've got to, say, get onto engineering about. So you've got to sort of make a decision about, how it's all going to work out do i need to change into another airplane that's going to take a little while do i need to wait for some weather to pass through and then there's some pressure from the maybe from the medical crew to to make a job happen so we've got to sort of explain how how we could do that so we might have to change their plans or change our plans so not so much nerves but sometimes just a, a lot of things going on at once a lot of balancing. Uh, yeah that's exactly right Mm, interesting. And so since you joined the Flying Doctor, are there particular skills that you think you've gained 
which you wouldn't have had had you not worked for the organisation? Uh, definitely negotiating communicating skills. So explaining to non-aviation people what we can and can't do and why, but putting that in a reason, not just saying, no, we can't do a task, but how can we do this different so that it's safe for everybody and being able to explain that. Mm. And so now your daughter is interested in aviation, is that right? Uh, yes, my daughter Bernadette. She has just finished an aviation degree with Griffith Uni, so she's just started her flying at Redcliffe. Um, and um, she's looking long term for the flying doctors as well, so I'd encourage her to do that. So it's a great life, it's a great job, and it's a great way to be involved in the community and use our aviation skills as well. So yeah, she's really enthusiastic and she's off on her way. How exciting. Has she always been interested in aviation just like you were as a kid? Yeah, well, I tried to steer her into medicine for the money, (laughs) but she uh, started out in that and then switched across to aviation. So I think it's in her blood. She's been around. She's been the one, the one out of our children to sort of take an interest and come out and wash aeroplanes with me and ask questions about them. So, yeah, definitely in her blood as well. And so she started flying. Does she have the same passion for it as you did? Is she just as excited when she actually gets to fly the planes? Yes, definitely is. Yep, she is. She's been waiting for a long time. She's a good girl, so she's been saving her money and she's been working hard and she's a good student as well. So um, she's very excited to start doing the practical part of things. Have you flown with her in the plane yet? No, she's just started her lesson, so she's not quite up to that, but I'll definitely put my trust in her. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> exciting, isn't it? So maybe one day we could see you both flying for the Flying Doctor. Yep, I hope I live to see that day. <laughs> How great would that be? That would be awesome. So if anybody like your daughter was starting to get into aviation and wanted a career in, with the Flying Doctor, what would be your advice to them in terms of practical things they can do and also maybe in terms of skills they need to focus on to be able to make themselves into a really good pilot for the Flying Doctor? Yep, uh, we have pilots from all different backgrounds. So we have some people that have flown for the airlines and then come to the Flying Doctors. Then we have military pilots come through here. We've had pilots that have, like myself, have been out flying in the bush and then come through that way. So there's no one path that you need to take to get to the Flying Doctor. Depends what your background is and what you like to do. But it's mainly a passion for the people of the bush and it's a passion for the sort of work that we do. It's not like an airline job where everything's taken care of the aircraft for you and all you do is fly the aeroplane. You have to be interested in being part of a small team, so with the nurse and the doctor, working independently and then doing those extra things that nobody else is going to do. We don't have full-time engineering support, so sometimes we have to come back maybe late at night or early in the morning and then we have to make sure the aeroplane's ready for the next crew. So that might mean topping up oxygen, uh, making sure the aircraft is refuelled, putting oil in the... Uh, in the engines, cleaning the windscreen. So you've got to be sort of an all-rounder, not just focused on the flying side of things. Mm, Interesting. And what would you say the hardest part of the job is? Probably what I just described. Sometimes you're very tired uh, after a long shift, but you've still got to make sure that the aeroplane's ready for the next crew. And it's, um, it's dealing with people. You're dealing with the pilots who are coming on to the next shift. They might be cranky because something's not quite right with the aeroplane that you did. Um, you're dealing with people that you're not used to dealing with, perhaps as a pilot. You're dealing with medical crew, so doctors and flight nurses. And, and those, uh, there's some fairly strong personalities in there just because where they, have to, where they have to come from, what they have to do to get into those positions, they're usually fairly uh, strong personality type people as well. So you've got to learn to deal with all that and then operate the aircraft safely, which is the number one priority. Yeah, so perhaps being a calm person is a really good trait to have if you're looking to get into the flying doctor. Yeah, at least calm on the outside. (laughs) (laughs) And would you encourage, if somebody was thinking, oh, I would go into, you know, I want to be a pilot, but I'm not sure whether to go into um, the airlines or whether to do charter flying or that kind of thing, or whether to come into the flying doctor, would you encourage them to come and work for our organisation because it's so different to anything else? Yes, definitely. And it's a career that you can have for a long time. So sometimes people think that this is just a, a job that you would might use as, as a stepping stone to go to the airlines or something like that. But what we've found is most people that he, are here can make a, uh, a really good career out of just flying for the Flying Doctors. And it's a wonderful career. It's got a lot of variety. Um, speaking to people like you, we don't get to do it probably in the airlines. Um, there's other things to get involved with if you want to. There's the fundraising side of things. But 
just purely career-wise, I would highly recommend it just for the variety that's involved. We operate some very good equipment. They're very well maintained. And the variety of work that you do, getting involved in the community, I highly recommend it. And is that part of the satisfaction for you in working for The Flying Doctor? I mean, obviously you get paid, but, you know, for many people, for the airlines, they want that monetary reward. But for us at The Flying Doctor, you get a bit more than that, don't you? You get that satisfaction of knowing that you're helping people and helping people out in the bush. Yeah, if it's just money you're after, probably airlines is a better way to go because there's you know a lot of advancement that you can go through to the airlines. But yeah, there's a lot more to it with the with the flying doctors. It's still a good wage that you can use, but there's more to it in that you're involved in the community and uh, working as a team to make the world a better place. I guess. That's RFDS Queensland section senior base pilot in Brisbane, Steve Wallace. If you enjoyed that chat, make sure you take a listen to the other stories in the Routes to the Runway series. You'll hear from RFDS pilots who've been trained in the RAAF, from bush pilots who used to fly 10 to 50 feet off the ground, and even the pilots who dropped out of university to follow their dreams. I'm Edwina Stott, and this is the RFDS Queensland Section podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next time.